Thank you for joining us today for this microfocus session at SUSCON Digital 2020, Threat Hunting in Action, Detecting the Unknown. My name is Fiona Ng. I'm the Analytics Product Marketing Manager here at Microfocus, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Paul Reed. Uh, Paul, take it away. I'm Paul Reed. I'm a technology strategist at Intersets, and I also lead the Threat Hunting team. And so in today's webinar, we're going to talk a bit about what threat hunting is, why threat hunting with UEBA is so important, and kind of how do we get to this point that we have this issue of so much data and trying to manage it in such a way that we can find the threats that truly matter. A little bit about Interset itself. We're now part of the MicroFocus company. We were acquired uh, last February. And what's really interesting about our company is we come with a, uh, a data science approach to security, right? We've, we've started out by looking at it from a standpoint of how can we take and help people understand better the threats they're seeing, not from the traditional ways today's of tools, tactics, and procedures, but more from a behavioral standpoint. And to be able to accomplish that, we built a 100% unsupervised online machine learning system. And what does that mean for you? It means that our data scientists ahead of time have not determined what good and bad look like, but instead allow our system to learn what that is in your organization. So once the system is deployed, it'll take a period of time to understand what your behaviors look like. And from there, start drawing some inferences when those behaviors change. To be able to do that, we need some really strong threat detection algorithms. We have about 450 of them today, and they continue to grow over time as our data scientists do new research or we're bringing new data types into the system. Today, we're working with about 13 different data types, everything from uh, EDR and Active Directory, VPN, uh, Web Proxy, uh, and some of the more common ones like repositories, whether that be a file repository or an enterprise document management system. But to do this, we really put a lot of effort into it. We've got about 100 person years of effort uh, into the product, and that really shows in the maturity of our models and maturity of the findings that we're able to take and uncover. We've been very fortunate. We've been recognized by a number of different people in the industry about the quality of our software. In particular, um, Inkutel was a was an early one who recognized the ability of Interset to deliver meaningful user and entity behavior analytics. So the question becomes, how did we get here today? Right? We have this challenge we're facing where our socks are continuously busy. There's always so much activity. There's always more work than we have people for. And our threat services keep expanding. And that's really because the pace of business has changed. The interconnectivity of us with our partners, with our customers, has really allowed our businesses to grow and flourish and become more profitable. At the same time, it's also expanded our attack surfaces. We're also seeing, too, that the type of attacks we're facing has changed over the past several years. The attackers have become much more um, prevalent. They are attacking in new and different ways. And really, we're looking at an asymmetrical type of situation where all the advantages historically have been for the attackers and not for the defenders. By using user and entity behavioral analytics, we start to tip that scale. We start to bring it back to a little bit more, you know, the defenders are starting to get the advantage because we don't need to know ahead of time how the attacks are going to take place. We see, too, that we have this, this growing trend of insider threats, right, where, where bad people may get inside of our company and do bad things by exfiltrating data or, or, or stealing secrets or stealing credit card information. But sometimes, too, those insiders are just well-meaning people, right? They're just trying to do their job, and either they get taken advantage of through some sort of phishing campaign, campaign uh, drive-by attacks, malvertising, all kinds of different things, or sometimes just pure IT hygiene can really cause us to have breaches when we don't need to have them. And again, we want to try to prevent these as much as we can. And the, the amount of maliciousness versus insider you know, um, attacks are, are kind of growing and we need to have ways to address it. So really when we think about what we're trying to solve is how do we take billions of things and get them down to a handful of high quality security leads? If I can help your threat hunters in your SOC or your, in your response center become more effective at their job, they'll do a better job at protecting your company. So if we can stop them from chasing every rabbit down every hole and only the ones that are the highest quality leads and the ones that are potentially most threatening to my organization at that point in time, we can improve your overall security posture. So how do we do that? We bring in data from a number of different data sources that we talked about earlier. There's some examples here on the screen from EDR to Active Directory, and we bring them into our system. 
Today, you're quite possibly doing that with the existing traditional security applications. You've already deployed maybe SIMs or other products out there that are using rules and threat holds and pattern matching, matching to take and detect some of those threats. And that does a really good job for those known threats, right? The things that we know are going to take place or that we've recently observed taking place. The only issue with that type of approach is it's really a rear window facing problem. We're looking in our rear view mirror, but what's already gone past us and not necessarily looking forward to what's coming at us. And that's where the power of user and entity behavioral analytics really comes into play, right? We want to try to do that anomaly detection. We want to find those unknown threats as they're emerging. And really how we do that is by those changes in behaviors of our users and machines and networks, file shares and printers when an attack takes place. Regardless of how the attacker does the attack they do, we will always see some change in behaviors someplace inside of our system. And if we can detect those changes in behaviors, then we have a really great chance of being able to determine that something's taking place and really looking at new indicators of compromise. Why is this user logging more times than they have before? Why are they working at a different time of day? Why are they running this process they never run before? Why are they transferring more data to this website than they ever have before? Those are some of the examples of changes in behaviors that could be indicative of an ongoing attack. And really, we have a number of different outcomes from that that you'll see in our, our demo today. And we follow the MITRE ATT&CK framework nomenclature. So if you're already using that today, what we're about to show you will be very familiar to you and gives you a common language to be able to take and talk about uh, the results we're seeing from the tool. A big part of what we do with the tool is enable your threat hunters to hunt effectively for threats. And really comes down into three areas. We're gonna give you contextual, meaningful behavioral analytics results. And what does contextual mean? It means that not any one single activity by a user or a machine makes it risky. It's taken in its entirety over time. It's just not going to that new website or just that large download. It's in combination with all those activities together that raises the risk score of the user or the machine or a website. And you'll actually see this in the demo today. Those actionable insights we're going to take and provide you, we're going to provide you some really rich detail about what exactly took place, why we say this behavior is risky, how it's changed, and how it could potentially be threatening to you. So we're going to kind of help lead your threat hunters a bit. We're going to provide them some context of what they're looking at and also tell them why they should care about what they're looking at. And we'll see that today in the UI for the product. And lastly, once we get that, this preventative threat hunting and these insights are really going to help improve your overall threat posture for your organization. And that's really our end goal here, is we want to make your people more effective and really to do more with what they have today. A lot of the data you have today is already very rich in behavioral analytics. We just need a way to unlock it. So that being said, let's actually take a look at a demo that I'm going to show you right now. Now that we're inside the system itself, this is kind of the landing page that you come into when you first start up the tool. We're going to give you some overall information about the analytics that's been run, a little bit about the threats we're seeing, and maybe show you some things that you haven't seen before. So the first thing we see is the number of events analyzed here is about 70 million. We generate about 836,000 anomalies. So those are things that are different than what our baselines detected. And lastly, we generated 22 active risky entities. And then based upon the data sources being ingested, in this case, it's, it's uh, Active Directory endpoint data. Uh, we have some web proxy data in here, and I think some repository and file share data as well. We're able to light up different entity types inside of our system. Everything from users and machines and websites and shares and resources and controllers. In this case, controllers are like domain controllers or other machines that provide user authentication. We also give you a graph here that kind of shows what's your overall threat posture for your organization over time? How is it changing? How is it growing? This is a very um, macro view of, of your world. It's not meant to um, really be used too much for fine grain type of decision making, but overall just a feeling of what's going on in your organization. Am I more secure than I was several weeks ago? Am I less secure than I was yesterday? Just to give you a feel. The last thing we show you are your top five riskiest users. And here we have my top five. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start with Joshua Newman and look and see what's going on with Joshua's account over the past several days. 
So when I click on Joshua, I get a really nice view of his risk score over the past 30 days. And we can see in general that his risk score has been fairly low. It's only recently that his risk scores have gone up significantly, almost up to 100 over the past several days. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom into this area of Joshua's risk score. And I can do that just by clicking and dragging here. And now I'm looking at just the anomalies for this time period. And what you'll see is that we bucket our anomalies into four different buckets. We have low risk, medium risk, high risk, and extreme risk. And because our anomalies are scored from zero to 100, we can take and bucket them into those uh, percentile uh, type of areas we see here. What's also important to know too is that risk scores are equivalent. So if one user's risk score is 60 because of uh, activity done in Active Directory and Endpoint, and someone else has a risk score of 60 because of the activity done in VPN, and let's say a repository, they're equivalently risky. So you don't have to worry that, you know, I need to look at my Active Directory risks first, my VPN risk first, they are equivalent risky in the system. Now, when I start my threat hunting, I always want to look at the most extreme risk events first and see if that gives me enough detail to understand what's taking place. And if not, then I can start peeling back those layers and looking at some of the other layers of, of risk levels to see if there's more detail I can glean from there. So I'm going to use the slider here on the left. I'm just going to move it up to the extreme risk area. And that's going to show about 10 extreme risky events, which is what we have now here. Oh, one more. There we are, 10 extreme risky events. And um, now I can see that, you know, there's been stuff going on on July 14th and July 15th. And when I do my risk uh, threat hunting, I always start uh, with the earliest dates. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom here and work my way up through these anomalies and see if we understand what's taking place. So when I look here, I see that Joshua sent 767 megabytes in an hour to a website at legit.com. And it was on first access a significantly larger amount compared to what others would send to, do, to new destinations. So we have some very interesting information here already. We know that it's unusual for Joshua to send this much data compared to his peer group, and it was on first access. And that's what we call one of those rare models, right? We only do things once for the first time. And quite often that behavior on the first time you do something can be very indicative of what your intentions are. Generally, when someone goes to a new website for the first time, as we see here in this, in this graph, they only average about 26.7K in an hour. What we observed for Joshua, though, was 767 megabytes an hour, significantly higher, orders of magnitude higher. In fact, the graph is telling us that the expected highest user for anyone in this population is 767 megabytes. So clearly, Joshua is the outlier here. We also, too, provide some more detail, right? When a user sends unusually large amounts of data to a URL destination on their first access, this may be indicative of exfiltration. And the amount of data sent is the sum of all the data sent by the user's account to that URL. So we're trying to give you some of that additional detail about what you're looking at and why do I care that I'm looking at that. I also have the ability too to add some journaling notes here to take some down some information about what I've found from this investigation by looking at Joshua. And as well, I also have the ability too to set tags here. In this case, you can see there's already been some uh, textual tags added to this, but I can also add some visual tags as well. So I can use these tags here to indicate that, you know what, maybe we should have someone open up a case on this and look more deeply at this. I can also see, too, the actual raw events that Joshua provided to us, um, excuse me, not Joshua provided to us, but that Joshua did and that we ingested through our analytics system. So let's go ahead here and take a quick look. And I get this really nice Cabana uh, uh, time series graph here in front of me very quickly to show the, uh, the a graphical view of the data that was ingested for this anomaly. And when I look at it, I can clearly see that the data is happening at the top of the hour, two minutes, four minutes, six minutes. So it's happening on a very regimented timeline and that the amount of data being sent or the volume of events are staying pretty consistent around 15 to 17 events in that two minute time period. So already I can tell you from my experience as a threat hunter by looking at this, this does not look like human activity. This looks like something a machine would done because it's measured, it's the same amount, it's happening on a pretty frequent uh, time. And I can tell you that there's not a lot of entropy in this. We're not seeing a whole lot of randomness of activity, which is what you'd expect from a human. So already we know there's something interesting going on with Joshua's account. He's sending more data to a location for the first time, and it doesn't look like it's actually Joshua doing that. Something automated is. Next thing we see is very unusual for Joshua to work at this time of day. And we get this really great graph showing us exactly what Joshua's normally working hours are. 
The gray lines here, the gray rays extending out to the edges of the circle, tells us how probabilistic it is that Joshua was active at that time of day. The black line shows what we actually observed. So we can see that it was very unusual for Joshua to be active at the time that this, this activity took place. So again, we know some more information. Following on to that, we see that Joshua logged in a significantly higher number of times in an hour compared to others. People are typically log in about three times an hour and at most 31 times. However, Joshua logged in 45 times in an hour. So again, very, very unusual behaviors. We see what the average is for Joshua expected highest is and what we observe. We see what the average is for the other users in the population, the expected highest running users in that population. So again, very interesting to see that he did these many logins in an hour. Now, we also know something too about human nature, right? Humans are lazy. We don't want to do anything more than we absolutely need to. The fact that there is 45 logins in an hour probably tells me that whoever's running Joshua's account probably doesn't know what they're looking for, and they're bouncing around a lot and having to re-authenticate. We see following on to that, it was very unusual for Joshua to access uh, share drive network shares client data 38 times in an hour. Uh, Joshua typically accesses it one time and at most two times in an hour. Again, very, very unusual activity for Joshua to do. Much higher access than what we'd expect. And again, Joshua probably knows where his data is, so he's probably not hunting and pecking for it uh, in all these different locations. We also see, see too that it was very unusual for Joshua to access 19 unique projects in an hour. Typically, he accesses three unique projects in an hour. So again, this is telling us that we see some very interesting activity taking place that is not what we expect to see. Now, it's not necessarily the highest for him. It's almost in line with his average, but again, it was still unusual for him to do this behavior. Last thing, again, coming into the, the final part of this attack, we see, again, it was very unusual for Joshua to work on this hour based on past activity. Just like we saw before, we had a really great graph showing us that very clearly what happened. We then see that uh, there was a Joshua took significantly more than normal performing take, take action 60 times in an hour. He normally does a take action three times an hour. In this case, a take action could be a download, it could be a print, it could be a movement of that information somewhere else. And this could take place either in a uh, enterprise document management system, as we see this time for Josh, or it could have taken place in a source code repository. Either way, those models are very applicable to what we're looking at. Next thing we see is that uh, Josh was sent a large amount of data, 1.31 gigabytes in an hour using post, right? So again, let's take a look at that. We can see what the averages for Joshua expected highest is, what we observed and the average for others. Again, Joshua is definitely an outlier. One more time now, if I take and I go to explore raw events, I actually look at this time, I can again see those raw events that make up this activity and we'll wait for it to load here. But I think we're going to see based upon what's happened that we're gonna see a different behavior taking place. So in this case, when I look at the time series graph in Cabana, I can see it's much more choppy has a lot more entropy in it, looks more like human hands on the keyboard. As well, we have a new destination. We have this proxy destination 25.com where the information has gone to, where before it went to a website called legit.com. So clearly the behavior's changed here. We've gone from an automated process that was uploading information to something that looks more human-like moving data up to a cloud. We also see too, again, we have another working hour violation here. Again, unusual for him to work. We've looked at the previous two. They're very similar. But we also got something interesting here during this time period. Joshua triggered a violation for rural credit card data transmission 75 times. One of the things we can do with our systems, we can actually pull in additional data enrichment from third-party systems. In this case, a DLP system has made a determination that some of that information that was being uploaded it was blocked because it included credit card information. So even though it was not used necessarily in analytics to generate behavioral indicators of compromise, we were able to pull in an external one that still increased the user's risk score. So we saw this was brought in as, a, as an extreme violation based upon the, the uh, color of it. It's red, so that's an extreme risk type of activity. So again, that raised his risk score. Even though analytics itself didn't generate that result, bringing that data enrichment provided me more details as a threat hunter. So based upon what I've seen here, I certainly have a lot of information and a lot of uh, activity about Joshua's behaviors. And so I think we can come to some conclusions about Joshua. At some point in time, his machines become compromised. 
that some sort of automated process or piece of malware was put on his machine that went on and gathered some information and uploaded it to a command and control server, probably at that legit.com address. The bad guy took a look at that information and saw that there was meaningful uh, data there and connected back into Joshua's machine, probably through some sort of remote access Trojan, which may have been part of the initial malware deployment. That person then did some reconnaissance. They moved around different file shares to look at different data. They did some downloading, they collected some data, and then they tried to exfiltrate data up to the cloud. But in doing so, it contained some credit card information and that became blocked. So I think it's safe to say that's probably not Joshua doing this behaviors, but probably something malicious on his machine with a malicious actor behaving and acting remotely on Joshua's account. So I hope between the presentation today and the demonstration we've just done gives you a feeling of what the art of the possible is with user and entity behavioral analytics from Intercept and MicroFocus. And it will show you that by leveraging your existing data sets, you can gain more and meaningful insights into what's taking place and maybe uncover some of those unknown threats as they happen or before they become a larger problem for your organization and give you a better threat posture moving forward. I thank you for taking your time today with me to listen to this presentation. If you have further questions about what you've seen or would like to follow up, please reach out to your local uh, MicroFocus representative and they'd be happy to help you. Thanks again for listening today. Take care.